Good evening. We'll get started here. Uh, good to be back with you this evening. Deb and I left on Wednesday and tripped down to Kansas City to see her, her brother and uh, wife. And uh, we're trying to do that here more frequently as time marches on and uh, be able to support him in the aging process. And then visited my sister up in Ankeny on Friday evening and Saturday. And then we were with some good friends, many of you know, Craig and Marcia Johnson, and they pastor just down the road, and we have been friends since the Bible college and seminary days and enjoyed our time there with them and went to dinner afterwards and then came on home uh, just in time to hear Anna and Pete. Anna's going to come, and uh, she's bringing her summer to a close. As you know, she's been up to camp this summer working up there, but we'll be leaving this week for Southern California, and uh, so we'll want to uh, be following her uh, with our prayer lists, but we're going to have her come first in just a moment. We'll have prayer, and, and she will come and share uh, a word about her summer up at camp and then how we can pray for her as she goes back to school uh, here this week. And then Brother Pete will come. Uh, I have really enjoyed, and I've heard many of you say this as well, this summer series, the, song, the Psalms, the Summer Psalms series. <laughs> say that 10 times real fast. Um, but it's been a blessing and appreciated all those who have taken part in that and led us through that series and uh, Pete will be coming this evening and uh, directing us through yet another psalm. We look forward to that. But as we begin, let's take a moment and just look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we give you thanks for the fellowship of the body of Christ. And as we gather, may we come with uh, a Christ-like spirit of uh, our hearts, desires, and affections being, first of all, centered in you, and uh, then considering one another and how we might just uh, serve the ministering of your Holy Spirit and encouraging one another if there is any encouragement in Christ, comfort in his love, fellowship in his spirit, and compassionate mercy and understanding fulfill ye my joy that we be like-minded and have that same kind of love and encouragement towards one another and may we just enjoy that ministry of your presence among us and within us this evening we pray for Pete as he opens the word with us uh, may your spirit uh, lead and direct him as he uh, shares the word with us. And uh, may your word have free course in all of our hearts. And uh, may you accomplish your perfect will and plan as you continue to fulfill your purpose within each one of us and equip us for this new week that is before us. And we ask your blessing upon Anna as she comes and shares testimony of her summer and uh, how we can pray for her uh, headed into the fall months and this new year of school and study for her. Uh, we thank you for the time that she's been able to be here with us. And Father, we just rejoice in the wonderful salvation you have provided for us through your Son. We rejoice in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, we pray that we'll have hearts to live for him and serve him in the week that is before us. And we give you thanks for the blessings you'll bestow upon us this evening through the fellowship of your people 
and the ministry of your word and testimony of your grace to our hearts. We pray these things with thanksgiving in Jesus' worthy name. Amen. All right, Anna, you come. The Lord bless you as you share with us this evening. Well, uh, like Pastor said, I was at camp, uh, I think, the past 11 weeks, I think it's been, and it's been really good. It's kind of hard to think about it and, like, put it into words because there's a lot of different things, a lot of things God's taught me, but um, overall, it was just, like, really cool to see the ministry of the camp again, like, and just, like, how many people got saved or, uh, I don't know, just to see it from the outside, and at the end of every week, they would, like, have kids come up that got saved, or at senior high, it was like people that felt like they were being called to ministry, and it was just cool to see, like, how God has the power to change lives and change hearts, and, um, and it was also really fun, like, a lot of you guys were up here, like, I think almost every week someone from Harvest was there, which that was good, um, and really fun to just get to see everyone. Um, but then also it was really fun, uh, to serve alongside the staff. They just, like, they have such a focus of we're serving Christ and not just working and just, like, really trying to, like, make it so that we're unified. And I think that was really good. There's definitely days where I, like, woke up and it was hard to not compare jobs and have bad attitude about serving. But when everyone else was doing it and, like, encouraging each other to do it, that was very encouraging and convicting of my own heart. Um, we focused on Colossians 3, like during full-time week, we talked a lot about that, and then we memorized it a little bit in Water and Work Week, and they kind of just like made that the theme of the summer, and so one of the, I think it's verse 3, it says, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God, and that one really stuck out to me like through the whole summer, just the strong wording it is, uh, how it's like past tense, like you have died, and like our life is literally in Christ, and then um, I think it was just convicting to think about how often I think my life is actually mine, and especially like in the area of serving, like it doesn't matter really what I want to do because God put me there to serve. And then also verse 23, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than men. Um, and that also was really encouraging just to refocus on why I'm serving. And it was all for Christ and his glory. And so I think just in general, the Lord really just like reset my focus on why he wants me or why he put us here and just that my life wasn't, isn't my own. And, um, and so also they put a really big focus on discipleship because we have a lot of high school staff that like rotate in and out every week. And so that was kind of stretching, but it was good and, um, cool to see like when God gave me words to, um, do what I felt like I wasn't capable of doing. And so... I guess uh, in the fall, you could pray for me that, um, that that would just remain my focus, that it would be um, that Christ would be my life and that um, I can be others' focus and not so focused on myself. Even I think, like, I can be so focused on my walk, and that's good, but if I'm not, like, pulling others along with me, then, or even, like, giving... God glory and like so that others will give him glory too that's like not really have any meaning so that would be my prayer for this fall and that I can look for people um, that I can pour into and that for people to pour into me too like getting more involved in my local church because last year I was kind of but not as much as I'd like to and so I just like to get to know some of the ladies better so yeah, it was a really great summer, and thanks for letting me share. All right, so we're going to be in Psalm 73, so it's kind of a long one, so I have a couple weeks, and 
the more I've been preparing, I was saying to Whit, I may need to beg Jordan for a third week too. So we'll see. Because uh, there's just so much in here. It's so rich. Um, just don't want don't to rush through it. So we probably won't read the whole psalm tonight because we're not going to focus on all of it. I don't really know how far we'll get, but hoping to get to at least about verse 14. So we'll at least read through that. But this is ultimately going to be a different type of psalm. So this is written by Asaph. Uh, he was a Levite who led one of the temple choirs, and there's a few psalms credited to him, uh, 73 through 83 and Psalm 50. And so there, depending on your source, depending on the different people, there's some question of was Asaph more of a scribe for David, or Asaph and David kind of used synonymously. That matters less because this is universal. The crisis of faith that Asaph faces is something that we all deal with all the time, and sometimes in huge ways and sometimes in just day-to-day -day little ways. And so the reason I picked this psalm, and I'll get to it a little later, but I had a crisis of faith a few years ago after an event that this psalm really convicted me. It really, I was reading in front of me, wow, this is exactly what's going on in my heart and the solutions in here. So tonight will seem probably a little more intense than next week because next week is the solution. Uh, tonight we're really going to focus on the problem, but the reason I, it's, you know, in my mind that's okay is because the solution is in the problem. And so identifying the problem, diagnosing it, and figuring out how did we get here helps us dig ourselves out of it and depend on the Lord. So let's read here. We'll read through about uh, verse 14. So truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore, pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore, his people return here and the waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the most high? Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease. They increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long, I have been plagued and chastened every morning. So we'll stop there. So just reading those verses at face value, this can kind of seem like Asaph is sitting there and watching all the other kids playing something that he wants to play and go, this is super lame that I can't be a part of that. But there is a lot of applications about the wicked here, and we'll talk about some of them. But this, the focus of this, uh, the way the Lord was ministering in my heart was really what's going on in my heart, what's going on in Asaph's heart that led to these perspectives about the wicked and this envy. So there's plenty to say about the wicked, but we're really going to be focusing on our side of the wedge. So the biggest, I mean, the punchline of this, if there needs to be one thing you take away, is this whole crisis of faith that Asaph's going through shows the danger of going from feeding on God's word to fasting on it, off it. And Proverbs 4.23 warns us, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. The input to our heart affects the output. We know that. And it's really easy to say that, and it's really easy to spend time in the Word. But just because we've read something, I mean, anyone that's ever had to study something, we know you can read through a paragraph, get to the next page, and go, wow, I have no idea what I just read. There's a difference between passive reading and active reading. And so just because we read the words doesn't mean that our heart is pouring them out. And I think times of crisis really help us identify what is our foundation. And so there, is a, there was a house a few years ago, Whitney and I looked at, that we really enjoyed. Every time we went by, it looked awesome. We kept kind of talking ourselves into, I don't know, I think this could be kind of a nice you know, upgrade. It has more space. It's a beautiful lot. It's in a great spot. It's not too far east that we can still get to Williamsburg, but it's close enough to the hospital. It's much bigger land. And we kept driving by. We really couldn't find any downside, except every time we looked, the price was going down. And we 
really couldn't figure out why. And so finally, it, it, it got to the point that we were seriously considering it enough that I reached out to the realtor and said, can we just have, you know, can you just, if you're allowed to, tell us why the price has been going down? Is it really just time? Is it really, you know, is there something, something we don't know? Because when we look at it, it looks awesome. And it's really checking all the boxes for us. And so this guy actually went above and beyond and sent us the uh, disclosure forms. He gave us all these things. And unfortunately, this house's foundation had had huge issues. And so there were huge cracks that had led to a huge flooding event in the basement. And they actually had to replace a whole foundation wall down in the basement, which unfortunately led to the price going down. And so we said, OK, thank you. Uh, very grateful you told us that. But again, it kind of betrays that we don't know until there's been a storm what our foundation is and how that foundation is going to hold. So similarly, as we're looking at this, really pay attention to what is the foundation of Asaph's heart? What is the foundation of our heart in a crisis of faith? MacArthur, when he's talking about this psalm, says this psalm illustrates the results of allowing one faith, one's faith in God to be buried under self-pity. So now we get to self-pity. Well, what is self-pity? Self-pity, the dictionary says, is self-absorbed unhappiness over one's troubles. So when I read that, what I hear is discontentment, basically. Um, and basically, it calls into question the character of God in our hearts. If God were so good, I wouldn't be in this situation. If God would only do this, things would be better. If I didn't have to deal with this, things would be better. But instead, we're focused on this is how I've been wronged. So discontentment is actually going to be the foundation of this passage. You know, we talk about envy, but really it comes back to discontentment. Colin Smith, in one of his sermons, I was just listening to it on the drive up, his sermon is titled, and he's quoting a 1700s uh, pastor, The Hellish Sin of Discontentment. Because his whole point is that the three elements of discontentment are the three main sins that Satan and his angels did that led them out of heaven. And those were uh, pride, rebellion, and unbelief. And discontentment is fed by all three of those things. And we'll talk about that a little bit. And so here, with regard to uh, discontentment, Colin Smith says, pride and unbelief nourish discontentment. So how does my heart respond when my life seems unfair? Proverbs 4 says, ponder the paths of your feet. Let all your ways be established. Don't turn to the right or the left. Remove your foot from evil. So this is an active process that we continually have to monitor. So I said this psalm meant a lot in my life. So May 5th of 2019, it was a Sunday afternoon, Whitney and I and the kids, we just had the boys at that point, right? I mean, it wasn't, yeah, it was just the, yeah. Um, driving home after church, it was about 1245, and we were on 80 right before the Oxford exit, driving home east. And we saw kind of a car in the median, and you know, you see that, you get kind of used to that on 80, seeing those things. And, didn't see much. It looked like it had just happened. You could still see some smoke in the car. And there was one or two people there. And as we kind of drove by, you take note of it like you do. Um, and suddenly, I saw an adult doing what looked like CPR on somebody. And so kind of, I turned away and I said, I should probably pull over and see what's going on. And so we ended up pulling over. I very safely got across to the median um, and came upon what was an adult doing CPR on a child. And this accident had just happened. And so I went running to the car and pulled out three more children and didn't know where the driver was, didn't really know anything about anything. But at this point, cars started to come and stop. And there were multiple people trying to be helpful. And so kind of had to start, you know, without going into too much detail, started to have to take care of multiple people at once. So I was kind of running group to group, making sure people are okay. We, dispatched out the helicopter and ambulances and all these things. And so, long story short, that ended in uh, three children that died and one that was critically injured at the hospital. And so, I ended up staying there a while. I went in on the last ambulance. And so, I, obviously, that's part of what I signed up for. That's my job. I'm an ER doctor. I'm an EMS guy. But those things don't get any easier. I've been, I've never been in a scenario like that in my church clothes with nothing trying to do stuff, but I've been in similar scenarios, but this one just really rocked a lot. And 
It took a long time to process. To make matters worse, my parents were in town because Whitney and I that afternoon were leaving for Chicago because the next day I had my oral board exams for emergency medicine. And so that was kind of a weekend where we had been getting things done so we could get out of town because I needed to be focusing on this test that would decide if I was board certified. And so this was very inconvenient timing. Um, so got through boards, we got through Chicago, came home. I, I was able to just kind of stay numb to it because I needed to focus. And I just really started, I didn't notice where my heart was at until somebody very, in a very gracious and wanting to be helpful way, it was trying to be comforting and just said, you know, this was God's will, don't forget he's sovereign, and just started sharing truth with me about God's sovereignty, God's truth, and it ticked me off and actually made me really angry. And I was very upset because I wasn't ready to hear that, you know, it, that mentality of let me wallow. I want to be angry, just let me be angry, leave me alone. Those truths are not helpful right now. Um, I was just really struggling through, if this was God's will, why did I even have to stop? You know, if this is, if God's sovereign and this is going to happen anyway, what's the point of my job? I mean, if, if God has decided all these things anyway, why am I a doctor trying to fix anything? You know, and just, this started to wallow. Why do I have to now carry all these images in my head? Why did I have to be there and couldn't do anything? Why didn't we have my truck where all my supplies are? All these things, I started to resent God. I got angry at the driver. You know, how could you do this? How could you cause an accident like this? Didn't you know you had a car full of kids? And then I got jealous of others uh, in their ignorance. You know, you have no idea what's out there. You have no idea the hardships that people actually deal with. Your problems are not that serious. You know, if only you had the perspective I have. And then I started to resent future patients. You're wasting my time with ankle pain. You know what I just had to deal with? You know, that's something I have to teach the residents regularly is one of the hardest parts of our job in emergency medicine is what we see room to room. The patient has no idea. Patient knows, I've been sitting in this room for six, seven hours nowadays, and I need someone to see me because my ankle hurts really bad. They have no idea what I just had to do in another room, but that's not, that's not their fault and that's not their job. And so we so easily start to resent patients for not knowing how hard our life is, you know? And we do that in other ways. So anyway, so with all these things churning in my heart, I was not in the mood to be hearing truth right now. Truth was not helpful, it just incited further resentment and bitterness. And over the course of really what was weeks and months, um, the Lord really ministered to my heart in this psalm because I started again. I started to see these things. I'm envious. Not necessarily that people that were trying to comfort me are wicked or that patients are wicked, but I was just envious of what other people had or didn't have to deal with. And it wasn't until the Lord really turned things around that I started to see the blessings and I started to see his work in this. It's not a coincidence that I was the one there. I was finishing up my fellowship, so I knew every ambulance. I knew the helicopter. I worked with them three times a month. I knew the dispatcher. You know, I was well trained. I'm not a dermatologist, so I was actually able to be somewhat helpful, you know. Um, and since then, I have had coworkers that I've been able to minister to in really hard scenarios they've been in, you know, t giving testimony to God's grace. But again, until you see these things from spiritual perspective, this is meaningless and we're just going to wallow. So anyway, so that's where this means to me. This is why this psalm means to me and how I got here. So I can relate very much to Asaph. So verse 1, truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. This is a statement of belief, truly. In other um, uh, translations, it says purely. In other translations, it says it is truth. God is good. To such as are pure in heart. So God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. Statement of belief. This is how God's word works. The truth of God's word is that God is good. When we wallow in discontentment, we are saying God is not good. Every completion of every thought of discontentment is God is not good. The pure in heart is the blessed man founded in truth of God's word. He feeds on his word with the fear of the Lord that allows him to see truth. He has spiritual perspective. Proverbs 2 says, if you receive my words and treasure my commandments, incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. If you cry out for discernment, lift up your voice for understanding, and you will understand the fear of the Lord. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He is a shield to those who walk upright. He guards the paths of justice and preserves the way of his saint. So the fear of the Lord is protective, guiding, and sanctifying. Proverbs 8, further talking about wisdom. 
The words of wisdom are plain to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogance, and the evil way. Those three things are seeds of discontentment. So the fear of the Lord being immersed in God's word and it meditated on our heart is what fights those seeds of discontentment. So how do we get to where this really takes off? Well, Satan attacks often by taking a truth, distorting it, and then getting us to embrace that distortion which slowly separates us from God's word. And suddenly we're now into a temporal focus. So if you think of Genesis 3, the first attack on God in the Bible is the serpent on Eve. He's essentially asking Eve, is God really who he says he is? Did he really tell you you can't eat anything? Did God really say that? Is he just saying that to keep something from you? And really starts to sow, because God did say, do not eat of this. So was that true? Did God say not eat? Yes. But now he turns that to say that he's saying don't do that because he doesn't want you to have something. He wants to take something and rob you of something. He doesn't want you to be his equal. And so, again, this is fundamentally going back to God is not good. Satan's first challenge of God in Genesis 3 is God is not as good as he says he is. So, this statement in verse 1, truly God is good to Israel, to such as is pure in heart. This is truth. And this is the truth that he departs from. And he'll say that. And this is the truth that we have to cling to. You know, when I got asked what the title of this is, most of this is about envy, but the whole focal point is truly God is good. That is the truth that we've lost. When we lose it, we head into what we're going to talk about. When we regain that perspective, that is when we can be ministered to by the Lord and we can minister to others. So truly God is good. Now into verse 2. But as for me, unlike the pure in heart, that are seeking wisdom, that are immersed in God's word. As for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. So he hasn't totally fallen off the cliff. He's nearly and almost. So he still has one foot kind of near the truth. He still has his experiences with God. He still has what's written on his heart. But he's also now amidst this trial. So he's nearly slipped. The Psalms repeatedly talk about the stability of God and abiding in his word. Psalm 55 says, Cast your burden on the Lord, he will sustain you. He'll, he shall never permit the righteous to be moved. 62, God is my rock, my salvation. I shall not be greatly moved. And my refuge, my strength. Proverbs 3, Keep sound wisdom and discretion. Then you will walk safely. Your foot will not stumble. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Proverbs 4, when you walk, your steps will not be hindered. When you run, you will not stumble. Proverbs 12, the root of the righteous cannot be moved. So those are all the truths when we are immersed in God's word and when truly God is good is the motto of our heart. But Asaph says, but as for me, that, I'm not that guy. That's not the truth that I'm hanging on to right now. I'm losing my stability. Spurgeon, when he was sermonizing about this Psalm, which was insane, that was, I, that was crazy to listen to that. Uh, he says, when men doubt the righteousness of God, their steps begin to waver. And that's essentially what we're seeing here. And thankfully, Asaph has self-identified that because that's the beginning of the problem. You know, I, I'm a doctor and I try and help people, but nowadays, Dr. Google does a lot of my job for me. And so you're not coming to me often because you want to know what's wrong. You're coming to me because you need the treatment. And so... It used to be you needed me to also help you figure out what was wrong. Nowadays, everyone knows everything. But um, the point is we have to know what's wrong before we can fix it. And Asaph knows what's wrong. I've stumbled. So the blessed man is established. But as for me, I am not that blessed man with the truth as the foundation of my heart. So Asaph's heart is moving towards the God is not good side of things. He's pointing out that his leaf is withering. Psalm 1, talking about the blessed man, says he's like a tree planted by the rivers that bring forth its fruit, whose leaf shall not wither. Asaph's saying, I'm starting to wither a little bit. My feet are starting to stumble. But why is he slipping? What is this crisis of the heart? Move into verse 3. For I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So truly God is good to the pure in heart. As for me, I'm not one of the pure in heart. And so I'm stumbling. Why am I stumbling? Because I'm envious of the boastful and I saw the prosperity of the wicked. So envy. Envy is a destructive sin of the heart 
that's often hidden but toxic to those around us as it inevitably leaks out. It's a desire for what we do not have and comes from a heart of discontentment. We're back to God is not good. And it's that trio of what are the seeds of discontentment, pride, rebellion, and unbelief. James 3 talks about if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. And he identifies that in verse 21 when he talks about his mind was vexed. In other translations, it says his spirit embittered. He identifies what envy did to his heart. So Timothy Keller in the book called The Songs of Jesus talks about uh, envy. To envy is to want someone else's life. It's not just that they don't deserve their good life, but you do, and that God hasn't been fair. This is spiritual self-pity, which forgets your sin and what you truly deserve from God and drains all the joy out of life. So what does envy do? It affects your view of God, of yourself, and of others. And we're going to see that progression here. So what are the truths we've forgotten when we're in a heart full of envy and discontentment? God demonstrated his own love toward us while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son. We're forgetting that truth. 1 John 1.8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So we go from envy to discontentment to the truth is not in us. So by definition, we cannot have spiritual perspective because the truth is not in us. We are back to our instinctual fleshly self. So the truth we've forgotten is we're sinners that deserve death. By God's grace, we were saved through faith, not of ourselves. We are saying, when we forget truth, we are saying eternal grace we didn't ask for and that we don't deserve isn't enough because there's things I'm seeing around me here on earth that I don't have and that I want. Because of that, God is not good. Forget the eternal salvation I have. I don't like that he has that and how prosperous these boastful people are. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 9 says, Also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, perseverance godliness, godliness brotherly kindness, and brotherly kindness love. He who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. When we have forgotten the truth and we are quenching the spirit and there are no longer the fruits of that spirit out in our life, we are indistinguishable from the wicked and from our unsaved self. So we've gone again from envy to discontentment to the truth is not in us internally now, externally, we are indistinguishable from the wicked. So this very person that he is angry that they have whatever they want, he is the same way now, just minus the temporal blessings that he's jealous of. So, of course, that's going to feed more discontentment. So, the truth is not in him, so he can't know these verses that tell him not to envy the wicked. He talks about, do not, envy, do not let your heart envy sinners. Be zealous for the fear of the Lord. Do not be envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious. A sound heart is life to the body. Envy is rottenness to the bones. So there's a lot of scripture in here because that's the whole point. We have to stay immersed. And it's not just about me proving it to you. It's about God's word continually hammering us over and over with the same truth that we have to cling to. So I thought this was a really interesting statement, and it's true that envy is the only one of those seven deadly sins that we hear about. Envy is the only deadly sin that does not ever have any period of pleasure. There is never a moment when we are suffering from envy that we get to enjoy, even temporally, that emotion, or whatever you want to call it. There's no satisfaction that comes with that. And I thought that was really interesting because Colin Smith in another sermon is talking about how discontentment gives us a taste of hell because we become our own tormentor when we are suffering from discontentment, which I thought was really interesting. But again, that's the folly of us separated from truth with a heart that is not founded. So Psalm 37, Psalm 73 and Psalm 37, I like to think this was God's sovereignty, that the numbers are flipped. They are very intimately related. And the 
sermons that Pastor Jordan went through are very parallel to this same passage because the same attitudes, the same needs that walk you through Psalm 37 are vital to Psalm 73. But in Psalm 37, 7 through 8, it says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Do not fret, it only causes harm. Well, what is that harm? The harm is further separation from God and a heart closed off to his working. So Jerry Bridges is another one in the book, Respectable Sins, uh, that talks about envy as well. Envy is the painful and often resentful awareness of an advantage enjoyed by someone else. Sometimes we want that advantage. Sometimes we just resent the other person for having something we don't. And I would add on the flip side, sometimes we're frustrated that we're dealing with something that they don't. And that's one that I can relate to very often. You know, why am I the one that has to deal with this? If only you knew all that's out there. There's two conditions, he continues, that cause us to envy. We tend to envy those whom we most closely identify with. So that's the first one. So that's real scary when we're talking that we're envying, envying the wicked in the world. We most closely identify with them. When we depart from God's word permeating our minds, we start to identify with the world, which causes further separation. So earlier we talked about these virtues that Peter was talking about, that without them we're now indistinguishable. Well, he goes on to say, if these things are yours and abound, you'll be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed. So that word barren, so if we don't have these things that we've said, we already know, we have a heart full of envy and discontentment. The truth isn't in us, so we are lacking these things. We are barren and we are unfruitful. So what is barren? It means inactive, indolent, or useless. Indolent is a word used for brute beasts, just instinctual, dumb animals. So without these things, we're dumb animals. And we'll talk about that later too, probably next week. And then unfruitful. Well, we've already talked about without these things, we are indistinguishable. We are no longer fruitful. I have friends that can tell me the gospel. They can tell me the truth because they've read it. You read the words, you can spit them back out, but there is no fruit. They are not sanctified. This is not, there's not a tra God's transforming power is not in their life. They have a knowledge of it. Anyone that takes a Bible class in college has a knowledge of it. That's different than sanctifying work. Being unfruitful is what distinguishes us. So, we're of the world. It's changed the posture of our heart. James 4 says, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. 1 John 2, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of, the, of God abides forever. So we say we're envying the wicked. We're indistinguishable from the wicked. And now we identify with the world, and we say God is not good enough for us because we choose the temporal. God is not enough because I don't like that he has that, and if I had had that, then I would say God is good. But where does that end? That continues. Well, now that you have this, yeah, but he also has that. I was telling Whitney, I was talking to a resident who's looking at jobs last night, and he was just saying to me, how can you stay at an academic place like this, how, you know, you, versus some of these other places where you would get this and that? And I said, well, I mean, every place has its things. You know, you're going to leave here, the things you hate here, you're going to go there and then find out other things. One of my closest friends who's a doctor elsewhere at what most consider to be the kind of place everyone wants to be because they make so much more money and don't deal with some of the, you know, the big machine that's the university, his schedule's terrible. I mean, he'll work an overnight till 6 a.m. and then have to work at noon across the state. And then he'll work an overnight the next night and then work in the morning. You know, I mean, he works these crazy turnovers that for us we knew the time was what we cared about it wasn't the money other people it's the money don't care about the time you know every place has its things but it's so easy for us when we are identifying with something going man if I just could finally reach that threshold then I would be content but since I'm not God is not good so we envy things that we most closely identify with and as we've just shown when the truth is not in us we're indistinguishable and we're back to being an unbeliever but number two, we tend to envy in the areas of life that we value most. 
when earthly matters are what we value, we lose sight of spiritual reality. Pastor Jordan, a few weeks ago, said idolatry is changing worship from spiritual to sensual and superficial. And we have that verse, covetousness, which is idolatry. It's the same thing. What are we giving value to? John 6 says, do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life. Matthew 5, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. James 1, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. So when we envy the world, we've given birth to sin. And the truth of the word is not in us. We are right back to where we started when we were born. Those are the two things that mark all of us when we're born. So what are those, what am I valuing in my life most? And what are others seeing me value most? You know, I think of my kids. What are they seeing me invest my time and my energy in? What do they see me get most fired up about? Is it the bears? Not anymore. <laughs> I'm just kind of giving up. But uh, things that I do have some sort of hope for. Um, what are they seeing me get passionate about? Is it something on TV? Is it some news article? Is it a sports thing? Or am I getting fired up about something I read in the Word? You know, what am I spending all my time in? I remember getting convicted early on when the boys were young. I heard them kind of playing together and just playing make-believe. And one of them was clearly dad because he had his bag on and was like, sorry, I can't. I have a meeting. I'm going to work. You know, and that was what they saw. And that was what they perceived of what my identity was. And that was a huge... That was important because to some degree I can't control when I'm leaving, but I can control the quality of time spent with them. So what are others seeing me value most? So we're envying. And then he talks about that word prosperity. So the word prosperity used the prosperity of the, uh, the prosperity of the wicked. That word prosperity is the word shalom. So one of, the, one of the definitions of that is peace, but it also is to connotate the complete overflowing abundance. I mean, we don't really have an English word for it. It's just more abundance than you could ever imagine. But again, he's now talking from a, spiritual, or from a temporal perspective because he's back to being that indistinguishable from an unbeliever. So he's saying, I am seeing this complete abundance in that wicked man. And he's probably right. Think about the money thrown around in professional sports, celebrities. These, the, the prosperity, so to speak, the abundance that we see in the temporal realm is real. There are huge, ridiculous amounts of money thrown around. What changes is our attitude about them. And so, that's, so he uses the word shalom. If you just look up prosperity in the dictionary, it says, the, one of the definitions is the condition of being successful or thriving. Again, how are you defining thriving? Because if the truth is in you and you're reading God's word, as we'll talk about hopefully next week, maybe the week after, we're going to find out what is actually going to happen to the wicked and their spiritual inheritance. But that is not what's on our mind right now. If that was on my mind, I would not be calling them, calling what they have here prosperity. You know, um, I think about the Titanic. There was multiple levels, and the lower you were, the less money you had. And so probably most of that trip, everyone at the very bottom was hearing all the parties up above. They maybe got a glimpse of what was going on at the rich and went, man, that would be awesome. I really wish I was up there. I'm sure there was discontentment. I'm sure there was grumbling. Then they hit an iceberg, and water started filling from the bottom up. Who would have been the first people to recognize that? The people in the bottom deck. Wow, that's really cold water. I don't think that's supposed to be in here. And what did they do? They flooded to the top, and I assume some of them got on lifeboats. So I think about one of those people that yesterday was in the bottom deck, today is sitting on a lifeboat watching that ship with its tail up in the air, and those same rich, dancing, laughing people that were up on that top deck are now frantically holding on for their life to the very tip of that ship that's about to sink. And that's the perspective we have to have. We have to see the true inheritance of the wicked. If we are just looking at the now, we have missed the point. And he's acknowledging, I know I've missed the point. That's why I'm in this crisis of faith. So verses four and five, there are no pangs in their death, their strength is firm. They're not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued. So now we kind of move into, we've talked about how this affects our 
vision of God. God is not good. I've been wronged somehow because God hasn't given me what I want. But I think it's important also to think about this affects our interaction with others and our view of others and our attitude towards others. How can we minister? There's some that think Asaph was probably physically afflicted when he wrote this, which is why he is focusing so much on the physical of these people. Because again, we envy those areas we value most. If you don't have health, you're very conscious of those that do. So we've already said we're full of envy, resentment, discontentment, so the truth is not in us. So now what's my gauge? How do I decide what's true if, if it's not based on this? It's based on me, and that's not real helpful either. We start to convince ourselves we have the ability to perceive truth in our own abilities without the filter of God's word. And so I think this is my only medical analogy. I tried to do none. But so when someone comes in as a trauma, obviously we want to make sure you don't have a broken neck, right? And so you'll get one of those collars that fits nobody. <laughs> and we'll, you'll feel us kind of push on the back of your neck. We'll say, does this hurt? Can you move that? Is anything numb or tingly? All that kind of stuff. If you're over, well, even before that. So for your sake, most of medicine is based on risk scores that come up based on research so that you're not just dependent on my gut. Yeah, I don't think you're probably hurt. You seem fine. Everything's fine. Well, as we've talked about, we don't always know what's going on inside. So because of that, we use different criteria based on risk scores. You know, we calculate how concerned are we about this and that. And that helps dictate what we do so that you're not just dependent on me subjectively. There are objective things that help us make our decisions. So when someone comes in who's over 65 and they have an accident that meets certain criteria, no matter what you tell me, the research says over 65 with these certain mechanisms, your perception of pain is irrelevant. You can tell me you have no pain, we have to do a CT scan to know what's truly in there because your perception is not accurate. Um, there's other things in the younger, there's criteria that you know, if you're intoxicated, if you have a really bad injury elsewhere that's taking your focus away, you're not, you're not going to decide, you know, if you have a massive leg injury and you just feel me pushing you back here, you're not going to really be accurately focusing on what I'm doing up here because you're so focused on this pain. So there's criteria that tell us we cannot trust what the patient is saying by their, because they don't even know what's going on. So we need the truth of a CT scan to see what is truly going on internally. So we cannot trust the patient's perception of pain. When we have departed from the truth, we cannot trust our own perceptions. But we do. We start to embrace them, shout them from the rooftops, and that starts to dictate everything we do. Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Later it says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. 1 Corinthians 2, for what man knows the things of... For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. But the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. That's us. When we are in this setting, that has become us. This is not just your unsaved neighbor. When envy and discontentment's in your heart, this is you. The things of God are discerned, and we do not receive them of the Spirit of God because they are foolishness to us. So instead, like I confessed to early on when I was in the thick of struggling with this, how could God let this happen to me? Why did I have to deal with this? People were showering me with truth and it just made me matter. Because again, that was foolishness. I don't want to hear that right now. Let me wallow. I don't want to hear truth because what I'm feeling, what I need to go through is more important. God has not been good to me, so I don't want to hear how he is good now. The psalmist's observations are not truths, but they're generalizations based on a temporal perspective. And those generalizations affect our heart posture and what comes out. And that's where it starts to affect our relationship to others. Proverbs 18, a man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. You need to feel what I'm feeling. You need to know what I'm feeling. I'm going to be fed by you hearing it. I know I shouldn't probably say this, but I just have to get it out because I'll feel better. This will affect our relationship with God, but again, it obviously affects our relationship with others. So Acts 9, I'm going through Acts right now very, very slowly, personally. I've just always been really intimidated by Acts. It's just a lot of stuff and people I just don't know. 
It was actually a sermon Ryan gave a few years ago about naming a bunch of guys I had never heard of in the Bible, just various uh, missionaries and people that worked through the ministry, and I was like, man, I don't know anything about that. So I started to go through Acts. So Acts 9 is that period where Saul goes from being Saul to becoming Paul. So verses 1 and 2, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, asked for letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if we found any who were of the way, we might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So he starts to go. He meets Jesus on the road. He's converted. He's blinded. He's discipled by Ananias through verses 19. So he's now had a complete change of heart. He's been converted. He has met the Lord. Now he moves on into verse 20. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. All who heard were amazed, said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem? So there the Jews tried to kill him, so he was taken out by basket and now was ultimately going to Jerusalem to meet his brethren. He was saved. He had the joy of the Lord. He was on fire for God. He had all this testimony to share, and he had already made a body of work to prove that this was real. The Lord was using him. And he had met the criteria of an apostle. He had been ministered to -to face-to-face by Jesus and was showing that outflow. And he's heading to Jerusalem where the church has been founded. And what are they sharing about right there in Jerusalem? They are preaching Christ who rose from the dead. They're preaching repentance and the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. And then Paul shows up and they go, well, he's still Saul, but he shows up here saying, Brothers, I'm here. I've been saved. This ministry, this gospel you're talking about, I am a product of that. And they went, no way. There's no way that God would have saved you. I'm going to go preach this to them, but this could not apply to you. God would never do this. I remember all the things you did. They forgot the truth about the man directly in front of them and reject that God could save someone even like Saul. And that betrayed their own unbelief. They were now facing face to face. I've been saying all this, but now I'm being tested. Do I believe this? And they didn't believe it. This was based on their own perception. Well, I have enough of this that now I kind of know what I want to do, but because I'm not feeding on it this second, face to face, I don't know, this might be that one exception. But again, that was based on their own perception until Ananias provided them truth for their eyes to be opened. So then we go back to Satan's attacks. He takes that little bit of truth, distorts it, and then takes our focus elsewhere. So here we're really talking about those distortions that are based on our own envy, those things we value, those things we relate to, and our discontentment with the foundation being pride, rebellion, and unbelief. It becomes less about the truth and more about my truth. You know, I hear that so much now, that this is about sharing your truth, your truth. Make sure you're true to yourself. Make sure We have completely, you know, that's a different talk, but I have talked about, I think one of Satan's best attacks in our culture has been completely destroying the definition of love. But I think the same thing is happening with the definition of truth. What is truth? So think about, you know, Whitney takes photos and so, and she's excellent at them. And so you see the picture she took and it's great, but you're not there during the chaos. And I say that as one that's had to sit with our family in that chaos, but also I know the chaos she faces based on what she's told me, but you don't see any of that in the snapshot of the picture you're looking at. You see this beautiful, well-manicured family that is smiling, everyone's happy, you know, who knows behind the scenes who's getting pinched, held down, who's getting, you know, going to be getting spanked later, you know, you don't know anything, all you see is right there a bunch of smiling faces. But based on that, you make assumptions. You make, man, what a good looking family. Man, what a well behaved. And that can slowly turn to you. I wish my kids would do that, you know, because when we take pictures, it's a disaster. And you start to see that. We were having a discussion the other night about social media. That is what this has become. I'm going to put forth what I want the world to see. And then this is now the reality. This is what you are all going to see is this snapshot on this page or this quote I put up or these pictures I put up. No idea what's behind it, but if that's all I have to go on is those pictures, without knowing the truth, that is the only thing I can use to make decisions about. And we start to make assumptions. But those assumptions can get real dangerous. Um, Some of them are silly, some of them are funny, but 
that can also start to really feed resentment. It's one of the biggest, I think, dangers of social media is there's no accountability. You post it up, but there's no fact checking. Forget about concepts, just about a picture. You have no idea what's going on in their heart. But we can get into this attitude of, and, and less about social media, just in general, they have nothing to complain about. They have it all. They don't understand what I'm going through. Uh, if only they had to face this, then they would not be smiling so much. And this just betrays our discontentment and our envy because again, we are basing these on our assumptions. Based on what I know about my scenario and what I've decided I know about yours, I'm gonna make conclusions. So let's take some of those thoughts to their logical conclusion. They have money, so they can't have problems because the only real problems are financial. And so you don't understand what problems are if you don't have money. That's discontentment. God is not good. I don't have money, so I have problems. They have, pick a physical attribute. So they can't be depressed or lonely or have low self-esteem. Again, because physical attributes are what give you meaning. Discontentment, God is not good because I wasn't built this way. They have a nine to five job, so they can't have stress because they're home, they have weekends off, and I say this, I, I'm in the middle of overnights right now, I'm gonna go into work at 10.30 tonight and I got off at 6 a.m. I work kind of a weird cyclical schedule and sometimes I work weekends. There's times, residency, goodness, there were times I was so annoyed that I lived there, you know, and they have a nine to five job so they can't know what stress is because they get to be home all the time. They have weekends off because the only way to have stress is to work long hours or off hours. Discontentment. God isn't good because I have the wrong kind of job. They don't have kids, so they can't know chaos. Or they have kids, so they can't complain because they don't know the heartache of not having children. Because a large family is the only thing of chaos. Or children or no children is the only thing that causes despair. God is not good because of this circumstance I've been put in. All these things were based on generalizations, again, based on what I know about my scenario and what I've decided I know about your scenario. None of it founded in truth. And what does that do? When I'm thinking to these people that are complaining about their nine to five job and I'm in the heart of, man, if they only knew what it's like to have to be there overnight, to never see your family, all that kind of stuff, does that really give me a heart to minister to them? Probably not. This is not really a great way to maintain a therapeutic relationship. You know, I am not in a heart that is set up to minister to their hearts. All right, I gotta speed up here. So we'll move on. We'll just do a little more quick. Um, so verse six, therefore, pride serves as their necklace, violence covers them like a garment. Therefore is talking about previously, you know, they have no pangs in their death, their strength is firm, they're not in trouble, they're not plagued. Because of all those, that abundance, pride serves as their necklace, violence covers them like a garment. So he does identify the heart issue, because again, his feet have nearly stumbled. He's not off the cliff yet. He still knows some truth. He knows there's a heart issue here. He's just not quite in the right space to deal with it. And it's clearly very visible. We see that in Proverbs a lot. Necklaces and garments are external. They're visible. They're not things that are hidden. So the pride and violence that he's talking about are, are obvious. Pride's associated with the fool in Proverbs. I'm not going to read them all, <clears throat> but it's there. When pride comes, then comes shame. But with the humble is wisdom. Pride comes, nothing but strife. In the mouth of a fool is a rod of pride. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. That goes right back to our own perceptions. Violence as well. A fool's lips enter into contention, his mouth calls for blows. A fool's mouth is his destruction, his lips are the snare of his soul. Pride, by pride comes nothing but strife. Pride and violence are not great ways to create a friendship. He's complaining that they have pride and violence, but we just talked about his attitudes in his heart have not set him up on his side of the wedge to have a very good relationship either. So verse seven, their eyes bulge with abundance, they have more than the heart could wish. And then if we just jump down to 12, that's kind of his summary statement. Behold, these are the ungodly who are always at ease, they increase in riches. Again, temporally, that's probably true. They look healthy, they have a ton of money, they have all the temporal blessings, but again, that's not the point. <coughs> so he is lamenting about the abundance of the wicked, forsaking the abundance we have in God that's eternal. 
Proverbs 1 says, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. The eyes of the man are never satisfied. The backslider in heart will be filled in his own ways. So what does my heart wish for? Where are my spiritual eyes looking at? Are they spiritual things or temporal things? The psalmist's eyes have departed from the word and forget the truths of God's person and God's abundance. Psalm 37, trust in the Lord, do good, dwell in the land, feed on his faithfulness, delight yourself in the Lord, he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord and he shall bring it to pass. Proverbs 19, the fear of the Lord leads to life. He who has it will abide in satisfaction. Proverbs 22, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Psalm 65, we shall be satisfied with good of your house. You will greatly enrich the earth. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain. Your paths drip with abundance. In coveting the wicked, we idolize perishable things and we ignore the eternal abundance. We have lost sight of the eternal inheritance. So I'll kind of probably end there. Um, the point, though, is that as we move into the next part, he's going to do two more things while he's still on this envy, discontentment side of things. He's going to identify, so he's already now annoyed with the wicked, and it's already broken his ability to minister to them. But now he's going to notice that people are listening and buying into what the wicked are saying, and he's going to start getting upset by that, because he still has one more thing to talk about here. He says, they scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, and their tongue walks through the earth. So in another translation, it says, they scoff and speak with malice. With arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven, and their tongues take possession. Another one says, they speak as if they rule heaven, and their tongues parade through the earth. So the wicked are just continually building up themselves. I heard someone say God is allowing them to continue to pull the leash that they'll hang themselves with. You know, um, they focus. The fools are focused on the temporal, but all they're seeing is temporal blessings. So of course they're going to talk. I mean, they have everything they want, and if this is all there is, life's pretty good. They don't have pure spiritual perspective, so their pride's puffed up. They don't know the truth. A man's stomach will be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips, he should be filled. We get back to that. The input of the heart affects the output. The fool says, this is kind of where I'll end. The fool say in his heart, there is no God. Psalm 10 is a great tribute to the fool and his perspective on God. God is in none of his thoughts. His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above out of his sight. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. He says in his heart, God is forgotten. He hides his face. He will never see. He says in his heart, God will not require an account. Psalm 64 says, they sharpen their tongue like a sword, bend their bows to shoot arrows, bitter words. They shoot at him and do not fear. They encourage themselves in an evil matter. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They're corrupt. And then 2 Peter talks of the same, for when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through lewdness. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are a slave of corruption. When I begin to focus on the temporal more than the spiritual, God is in none of my thoughts. I'm making distortions about the truth of God, and I'm suddenly where Jeremiah says, God is near their mouth but far from their mind. The irony of this is that all these things that have led to pride, and in that pride have made the wicked say these things about God, when we have this envy and discontentment in our heart, we are saying the same things. We are embracing the same attitude. God is in none of my thoughts. God is not good. There will not be an account. If I'm jealous of what I see in front of me, it's because I have forsaken what's going to happen eternally. And I can speak to that personally. In college, I was only focused about what was in front of me. I'll deal with the spiritual stuff later. Right now, this is fun. doesn't seem like a big deal. No one's in trouble. I'll worry about it later. The eternal consequences are not in the forefront of my thought if I'm not meditating on God's word, if they're not wrapped around my heart. So, heading into next week, we'll get to the good news. We'll get to deal with the spiritual inheritance. But again, like I said, we focus so much on the problem tonight and how we got here because how we get out of here 
is the same solution. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you died. This is about, you know, cling to the truths. We know what our internal inheritance is. When we lose sight of that, we start to only see what's here. So he's going to do two more things and then finally identify the problem. He's going to point out that people are now listening to all this of the wicked and he's frustrated that they're getting followers. But finally, the big disaster is he's going to start questioning, why have I done all this myself? Why have I cleansed my heart? I've done it in vain. Why have I washed my hands in innocent? All day long I've been plagued and chastened. I've been going through all this stuff for no reason while they're getting all of that. He's lost sight and we all do the same thing and we do it in little ways every day when we're frustrated by something. One of my biggest pet peeves is when I watch people speed by and I just wish a cop was around. That's, that drives me nuts and so it's that same thing though. Man, I just want them to get some vindication, you know. So next week, we'll move into how do we turn around? How do we dig ourselves out of that? And it is when he enters the sanctuary of God and he starts to understand their end. So we can pray here. So dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the truths that are from your word that are unchanging and eternal, Lord. That while we were still sinners, you died for us, Lord. Even when we were in rebellion, when we were at enmity with you, you loved us enough that you sent your son to die. And we just pray that we would embrace those truths, Lord. Just search us, know our hearts, test us, know our uh, thoughts. And just pray that you would identify offensive ways in us, Lord, that we would identify those seeds of discontentment in our heart, confess them to you, that we may have a right view of you, a right view of your working in our lives who we truly are in the context of you and your Son and your Holy Spirit, and that we may be, be used in those around us and that we may rather than be dismayed by what seems to be unfair, we can instead have compassion and mercy and seek to minister in others' lives, Lord. I just thank you for all that are here. Pray that you would bless them this week, protect them, and uh, bring us back safely Wednesday and next weekend. In your name we pray. Amen.